Well, if you've filled up your car in the last week, you probably spent over $3 a gallon, and I bet you complained about it. <laughs> Historically, though, the price of oil today is among the highest levels it's ever been. But today's jump in gas prices is nothing like what Americans saw during the oil crisis of 1973. That's when Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC nations proclaimed an oil embargo against all nations they considered supporters of Israel during the Yom Kippur War, especially the United States. And so the price of a barrel of oil quickly rose nearly 300%. Americans suddenly found themselves paying outrageous sums at the gas pump. By 1974, people were shelling out over 50 cents per gallon to fill their tank. The horror. But seriously, the pain was real at the time. Gas had to be rationed due to misguided price controls imposed by the government. Filling stations ran out of gas and lines of cars stretched around the block. But it wasn't just drivers who were hurting. Oil fuels our economy. And so the price of everything went up. But there was one notable American who was not experiencing any pain during the oil embargo of 1973. And his name was J. Paul Getty, founder of the Getty Oil Company. Two decades earlier, he had bought the rights to some oil fields in the Middle East. And during the oil crisis, his earnings from those fields quadrupled. So the more Americans paid for their gas, the more money Getty raked in. The meek shall inherit the earth, he said, but not its mineral rights. This is the story of J. Paul Getty, the richest man in all the land. J. Paul Getty was born on December 5, 1892 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. When he was 10 years old, his father George moved to Oklahoma where he had bought the mineral rights to 1,000 acres of land. And within a few years, the wells on that land were producing 100,000 barrels of oil per month. The Getty family became instant millionaires. But as an adult, J. Paul Getty fell out of favor with his devoutly religious father due to his five marriages and five subsequent divorces. And upon George Getty's death in 1930, Paul was bequeathed just a tiny portion of the family fortune. But no matter, while other men were losing their shirts during the Great Depression, J. Paul Getty kept his head and was growing his inheritance through buying up desperate oil companies at a fraction of their worth. And eventually, in 1966, thanks to an estimated net worth of $1.2 billion, he was declared the richest man in all the world. Now, I'd like to tell you that J. Paul Getty also became the happiest man in the world. Just imagine all the people he could have helped with all that money. Uh, I'd like to tell you that he became the most generous man in the world. But that wasn't the case. J. Paul Getty was comically tight-fisted. He did his laundry by hand so as not have to pay a poor person to do it. When his sleeves became frayed, he trimmed the threads rather than buying new shirts from local businesses. He meticulously reused stationery and other office supplies. Famously, he had a payphone installed in his home uh, so as to lower his phone bill. And he insisted upon negotiating on absolutely everything to get the lowest price possible. One time, when he generously took some associates to a dog show in London, he made them walk around the block for 10 minutes rather than paying the full admission before 5 p.m. Now, this all seems kind of silly, right? We can laugh at an eccentric billionaire's foibles. But Getty's thrift didn't come from childhood anxieties or paranoia. His stinginess came from a dark place within his soul. J. Paul Getty was an evil man who refused to part with his money due to a deeply ingrained, unadulterated sense of greed. Now, how can I make such a harsh judgment on the motives of a man I've never met? Well, because he scolded his fifth wife for spending too much money on treating their son's brain tumor. He was 12 years old when he died. And since Getty was on a business trip at the time, he didn't bother to show up at the funeral. But honestly, no one really wanted the guy around anyway. One of his favorite pastimes was writing family members in and out of his will in order to keep them under his thumb. And Getty was so critical and disdainful towards his son George that it drove the poor guy to suicide. He stabbed himself, overdosed on booze and pills, and died. But not even these incidents are the most egregious example of Getty's callousness. In 1973, Getty's 16-year-old son-grandson Paul 
was kidnapped in Rome and held for ransom. He was pulled into a car, blindfolded, driven to a cave, and put in chains. The kidnappers demanded $17 million from the Getty family in exchange for Paul's safe return. And since the Italian mafia had been suspected of engineering the kidnapping, the police were of little help. The only way to get Paul back was to pay the ransom. But Paul's father didn't have that kind of money, so he begged his father, J. Paul Getty, to pay his grandson's ransom, which would have been a paltry sum considering his vast fortune. After all, this whole ordeal was unfolding during the oil embargo. At that time, J. Paul Getty was making $17 million per day, yet he refused to pay. He had 13 other grandchildren, he reasoned, and if he paid this ransom, then he ended up having to pay 13 more down the road. Yeah, hey, Gramps, how about saving your grandson's life and worrying about the consequences later? But Getty held fast, days stretched into weeks, and still he would not pay. It was a matter of principle. Well, the kidnappers grew impatient, so they mailed Paul's severed ear to the family, and they threatened to send him home piece by piece if the family still refused to pay. Public pressure was mounting on J. Paul Getty to just pay the ransom and spare everyone in the world the agony. Paul's condition was growing worse by the day. His mangled ear had become infected. His kidnappers feared he may die in captivity. It wouldn't be worth anything to them. They resorted to serving him copious amounts of alcohol to keep him warm and to dull the pain. The deal needed to get done now, so they lowered their asking price to $3.2 million. And finally, mercifully, J. Paul Getty buckled. He gave Paul's father $2.2 million to pay the ransom, which was the maximum amount that was tax deductible, and he loaned the other $1 million to him to be repaid at 4% interest. Everyone just shook their heads. Shortly after the ransom was paid, Paul was found shivering and bleeding, but still alive at a local gas station in Rome. Unfortunately, he never quite recovered from the mistreatment he suffered during his five months in captivity. He struggled with drugs and alcohol abuse the rest of his life and died at a relatively young age. And J. Paul Getty died a few years after the kidnapping himself on June 6, 1976 in England. He was 83 years old, and at the time, everyone in the Getty family pretty much hated that miserable, miserly old man. That was the price J. Paul Getty was willing to pay to become the richest man in the world. That was the return on his investment of millions and millions of dollars. Enjoy that, J. Paul Getty. You had more money than God, but maybe it would have behooved you to have a little more God than money. But I'm not using the story of J. Paul Getty this morning as another tired cautionary tale about the dangers of money, nor is this a lesson on greed. This is a message on kingdom economics. Because J. Paul Getty was a master of world economics. He took risks and worked hard. He bought low and sold high, and he spent less money than he made. And so I suppose we could admire him for that. But as we'll see from today's passage, the economy of the kingdom of God runs on different principles. And we can scarcely imagine how wonderful life would be for a spiritual J. Paul Getty who could master kingdom economics like this. The historic J. Paul Getty had more money than God, but a spiritual J. Paul Getty living according to the principles of the kingdom's economy would have more happiness than anyone who had ever lived. So I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bible to Matthew 13 this morning. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 45. Two little verses today we're going to look at. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take out one of ours located on the shelf underneath the pew in front of you. And if you turn that Bible to page 819, page 819, you'll find Matthew 13. Or feel free to scan the QR code on the worksheet in your bulletin with your smartphone to find Matthew 13. If you're new with us, I want you to know that this is message number six in our fall series of messages on the kingdom of God. In first century Rome, there was indeed a kingdom within a kingdom. One was physical, temporal, and brutal. The other was spiritual, happy, and unbound. Loyalties were tested, hands were forced, choices were made. By 476 AD, the Roman Empire was crushed by barbarians, but the kingdom of God is still going strong today. When in Rome, choose your citizenship wisely. 
And we've already seen how Jesus was ushering in a kingdom that was nothing like people were expecting. Jesus wasn't revamping an existing kingdom. Uh, he was establishing something brand new. His kingdom would be founded on faith, not force or fervor. The constitution of his kingdom consisted of just one law, which was to happily love one another. There were no borders in his kingdom. As we learned last week, the citizenship requirements were exactly backwards to get into the kingdom. The poverty-stricken, the scoundrels, and the notorious sinners were automatically in, while the wealthy, the powerful, and the religious had to wait their turn. But that's not the only thing that was upside down in the kingdom of God. As we'll see in today's passage, the kingdom's economic principles are totally bonkers. Just ask the two guys in Jesus' parable on the kingdom's economy. Let's look at Matthew 13, verses 44 through 45. Jesus told these two little stories. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. These two little parables from Jesus came with a slew of parables in Matthew 13 concerning the kingdom of God. Here's how Matthew introduced them in his gospel. It says in Matthew 13, All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. A parable, parable is simply just a metaphor. This was to fill what was, fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And so these parables, though seemingly very simple, are hiding some of the deepest truths about the human condition and experience since the beginning of time. And so think about that for just a moment. These stories aren't necessarily overpowering. They sound like children's stories. But in a few lines, Jesus shows us the mind of God. They can push your philosophy of life over the edge. They can shake the foundation of how you live. And as we see from these two guys, they can make you look like a crazy person. Now, if you haven't noticed yet from our series, Jesus never comes out and gives us an exact definition of the kingdom of God, so neither will I. The kingdom of God is real and it's literal, but it's not visible and tangible. It's here and now, but you can't see it or touch it. So it shifts and moves when we try to nail it down. It's so profound and beautiful and spiritual and philosophical that it kind of defies human description. And so Jesus never told us exactly what it is because I don't think our brains could process it. Instead, he told us what it is like. He needs to use metaphors to try to explain something that is of God yet is among men. So first he said that the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. And it must have been quite a treasure. Can you imagine how exciting it would have been for the man in Jesus' little story to dig up a buried treasure of unimaginable worth? But there was a catch. The guy didn't own the field that the treasure was buried in. The treasure wasn't his, technically. So he would have to make a bold move. Remember, the meek shall inherit the earth, but not its mineral rights. This reminds me of the time J. Paul Getty made the deal with Saudi Arabia that made him the richest man in the world. Back then, there was a neutral track of barren land between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait that no one really cared about. Some Bedouins lived there, and that was about it. But when oil was discovered nearby in 1938, suddenly everyone got really interested in this little track of land. The Saudis divided the land with the Kuwaitis, and the bidding war for the mineral rights was on. But no one was certain whether or not there was oil under those sand dunes. They just kind of assumed there was. It would be a huge gamble for whoever paid the exorbitant amount of money for the rights to those lands. But J. Paul Getty foresaw the hidden treasure in the field, and he outbid everyone else. In 1949, he leased the land from the Saudi king for $9.5 million up front, which was a lot of money back then. One million annually, and a royalty of 55 cents per barrel of any oil discovered there over the next 60 years. That's over 100 million in today's money 
which didn't even include the cost of searching for and extracting oil that may or may not have been there. And if it had not been there, then J. Paul Getty would have taken a 60-year bath. People must have thought he was crazy to pay such a price. He outbid everyone. For years, his company poked around in the sand without finding a drop. That weight must have been excruciating. But finally, in 1953, up through the ground came a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold Texas tea. And the next thing you know, old Paul's a billionaire. That hidden treasure in the oil field made him the richest man in the world. J. Paul Getty may have been a greedy miser, but he was no fool. But the man in Jesus' parable knew what was in the ground. There was no risk for him. All he had to do was buy the rights to that field, and it would change his life forever. So allow me to embellish the little story a little bit. The man would have had to inquire about buying the field from the owner. Now, historically, people didn't like to sell land, especially in ancient Israel. Remember, this was their little slice of the promised land. But the man in Jesus' story wouldn't be denied. Keep in mind, uh, he, 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 in my mind as I think about it, uh, he kept badgering the owner uh, to name his price. There was no cost he was unwilling to pay. So maybe the owner threw out some outrageous price just to get this guy to leave him alone. You know, sure, I'll sell you the field for $9.5 million. Now beat it. So the man, they shook on it, and uh, the buyer went about selling everything he had in order to raise enough money to buy that field. And everyone must have thought that he was insane. He started selling his furniture and his wife's jewelry, possibly. The animals were sold. The house was sold. His land was sold. He, it, the, Jesus said he sold all that he had. He sold his tools, his business, even the shirt off his back. He liquidated absolutely everything. He may have even had to take out a loan to raise enough money to buy that field. He may have had to borrow money from his greedy father at 4% interest. But it didn't matter. What he was going to get in return would far surpass anything he had to give up. And in the next verse, Jesus says that the kingdom of God was like a merchant who searched and searched for a pearl of great price. And when he finally found it, he sold everything he had to buy it. Now, if you've missed the last few weeks, then I need to stress this again. The kingdom of God is not necessarily heaven that Jesus is talking about here. You don't need to sell or do anything to get into heaven. Salvation is a free gift for us because Jesus already paid for it. He lived the perfect life we couldn't live. He died on the cross for our sins, and he was resurrected in victory, and he promises to give salvation, forgiveness, and a home in heaven eternally to anyone who simply trusts him for it. Look what he said. John 6, 40. Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, everyone who looks upon me, and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You don't need to pay anything for your salvation. You don't need to do anything for it. You don't need to make any promises. You trust Jesus, and he promises to give you eternal life. That's why we call it good news. That's why we're excited here to come to church. We're celebrating that we have heaven just because Jesus and what he did for us. That's good news. But the kingdom of God, as we've been saying this entire series, is not just heaven. Heaven is part of it, but the kingdom of God is clearly something that is here and now, according to Jesus, and it's worth paying any price of admission to enter in. Now, it's a metaphor, remember. We don't need to literally sell all our possessions to get into the kingdom. The kingdom economy doesn't run on money, of course. It's not a material kingdom. But nonetheless, it means everything for us. It means everything to us to be happy in this life. And since the kingdom of God is a happy kingdom, as we've been saying this entire series, then it will be worth anything to get in. And so it's the blessed kingdom, and I want to be blessed, don't you? So how do we enter the kingdom of God? What must we pay, quote unquote, 
to get into this happy kingdom? What's the cost of true happiness in this life? How does the kingdom's economy work if it doesn't run on money? Well, the answer may surprise you. Let's look at the parable again. The key in my mind is in verse 44, which says, In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. Look closely at that. This guy didn't enter into the kingdom of God after he gave up everything. He already had it. He had it while going through the process. He found the joy in the act of living according to the principles of God's economy. The man who gives away his life finds true peace, happiness, joy, and deep satisfaction. The more you give, the richer you get. It's not material wealth, of course. God's economy is not fueled by oil. It runs on joy. And the more you buy into it, the happier you get. Plus, you don't need to wait years and years to see a return on your investment. The return comes as you're investing. And this, by the way, is completely backwards according to typical, ordinary Christian thinking. Christianity normally teaches that we give up everything now to be happy later. We sacrifice here on earth, whether it's time, money, energy, talent, or whatever, so we'll receive even greater blessings in heaven. So it's completely acceptable to be absolutely miserable now. But don't worry, because you'll be happy later. And there's some truth to this line of thinking according to Scripture, but it's gotten all twisted up. Because this line of thinking is just a spiritualized version of the prosperity gospel. The more you give, the more God will give you. It's the same principle as the prosperity gospel, only the timeline is different. You just have to wait longer for the blessing, according to typical Christian thinking. But Christianity has operated on this faulty principle for way too long, in my opinion. You may be called to suffer difficult circumstances now. No doubt, it could happen. And you may be called to be uncomfortable in this life. But you were never called to be miserable. If giving of yourself makes you feel unhappy, then just keep it all, J. Paul Getty. If you're going to be miserable, then you might as well have the money too. You see, joy isn't some reward we earn someday for being a generous person now with our money, time, energy, talents, or whatever. If you're not feeling joy as you give yourself away, then you're not doing generosity right. You're not thinking right. You see, your entire mindset needs to be recalibrated. And we're not talking money necessarily. If you could somehow find a way to be deeply happy and fully satisfied while keeping all of your money and being stingy with your time and not having empathy for anyone else, then I would tell you to do it. But you can't. And I know God's economy seems bonkers because we've been conditioned our entire lives to think differently. But you just have to trust Jesus about this. You trust him with your salvation, so trust him with this too. Dive in with both feet. Pour out love to absolutely everyone regardless of their status or station in life. And then your faith will become seeing. You might have more money than God, but that doesn't make you rich. Happiness is the currency in God's kingdom. Wealth is measured by joy, and joy comes in the act of handing yourself over to loving people. So don't knock it until you try it. Because the Jesus life is everything you've ever wanted, I am convinced. That's why I talk about it almost every week. It isn't all comfort and riches and fortunate circumstances. Those things are just a bonus if you have them, and I hope you do. But you know you are in the kingdom of God when you feel the joy of hilariously giving your life away. So our main point from today's passage is this. In your bulletin, the main point is... When a grin's on your face, then you're in the right place. When a grin's on your face, then you're in the right place, the kingdom of God. I've already told you a story today that was absolutely dreadful, so we need to wash the taste of J. Paul Getty out of our mouths. So instead, here's the story of Charles Mooley. It's the greatest rags to riches and back to rags again story you've probably never heard. 
Charles Muli was born sometime in 1949, somewhere in Kenya. His father was a drunken, abusive son of a gun who beat up Charles, his mother, and his two siblings on a regular basis. But at least Charles had a home, which was more than many kids growing up in Kenya at that time could have said. Well, that all changed one day at six years of age when he woke up and discovered that his family had abandoned him. So at the tender age of six, little Charles had to beg on the streets to survive. Thanks to some benevolent extended family members, Charles was able to go to primary school, and he desperately wanted to go to secondary school, but the money simply dried up. So at the age of 11, he started finding menial jobs that allowed him to scrape together food and shelter. Eventually, Charles was able to locate his family, but they didn't welcome him back into their home because there was no room. And as a teenager, Charles started to despair even of life. Somehow he found his way into a church, and he heard the good news of the gospel. And Charles trusted Jesus, and he forgave his family, and he experienced new spiritual life. Then he walked the three-day journey to the city of Nairobi to start a new physical life. And it was there he met a kind and wealthy Indian family, and they gave him his first steady job in their fields. On the job, he met his future wife, Esther, the woman whom he would eventually have eight children. But as a Christian, he still felt a responsibility to provide for his parents and siblings. Unfortunately, his father took advantage of his kindness, stole his money, and continued to beat the family. So Charles and his wife adopted his little sister and moved away. With the money he had been saving from working in the fields, Charles bought a car and started a taxi service. As he drove around town, he noticed the orphan children begging for money, and he tried to help them whenever he could. Eventually, Charles diversified his business into oil and gasoline transportation, and then he went into the insurance business. And the poor Kenyan kid who had been abandoned by his family at the age six, as an adult, became a millionaire. He bought a huge house for his family, and he sent his children to the best schools. Life was good. But he was still bothered by how his father treated his mother and siblings. And after hearing about a particularly violent beating they had taken, he finally reported his father to the clan elders. They found his father guilty of domestic violence and proceeded to beat him to death, as was their law. But Charles was moved with compassion for his pitiful father and begged for his pardon. His father was spared, and his father was moved by his son's mercy and forgiveness. He too trusted Jesus. He gave up drinking, and he became a respectable Christian man. Now Charles Mooley truly had it all. He was on top of the world as he drove his luxury car to a business meeting one day. When he arrived, some orphans offered to protect his car in exchange for some money, but Charles ignored them. They would just use his money to buy booze or cigarettes anyway. Well, when he came back from his meeting, they had stolen his car. And Charles was understandably upset, but he wasn't upset about the car. He could buy a fleet of luxury cars. As he rode home on the bus, he was fretting over the well-being of those kids he had shunned. He used to be one of them, after all. And slowly but surely, the Lord started changing his heart. And then one day in 1989, Charles Mooley determined to sell all of his lucrative businesses in order to provide a home for orphan children. Charles used that money to start building huts on his property, and he immediately took in three street kids. His whole family was committed, and no child was turned away. But within two years, Charles had burned through his life savings. Now everyone would end up on the street, but they prayed and they trusted Jesus, and God provided. People started donating to their orphanage, which became known as the Mooley Children's uh, Family. Eventually, Charles Mooley moved the children to some land that he had purchased for his retirement, and they all started working to build their new home together. They built dormitories, they dug wells, they planted crops until they became a self-sustaining community. In fact, the Lord blessed the orphanage so much that they were able to donate excess food to other ministries. Over the last several, decade, last several decades, Charles Mooley has raised over 23,000 children providing them food, shelter, education, job training, but most of all, love. Their alumni are made up of doctors, lawyers, pastors, and missionaries. 
And at the age of 72, Charles is still taking in orphans. And here's why. Here is how he sums up his life so far. He says, they really have never felt love, talking about street children, even from their own parents. But now, having come to Mooley Children's family and me, as the father to all of them, they are really very happy. They're happy. Love is everything. It is above all, and therefore with love, you can change a human being and even animals when you show love. It is the greatest, as God also gave us love through his son, Jesus Christ. I want you to look at some pictures of Charles Mooley. Does he look sad to you? Does he look like a man who has lost his life savings? Do you think for a moment that he regrets selling everything to purchase the pearl of great price? Do you think God had to pry the money from his miserable hands when he finally arrived? He miraculously became happy? Of course not. He was happy the whole time he was giving. Loving the kids made him happy. And look at the children. That's what made Jesus happy after all. And he wants us to feel that too. Look what Jesus says in John 15. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, we need to get away from this so-called Christian notion that feeling miserable is a sign of godliness, when in fact it's just the opposite. We are not called to be miserable now so someday we can be happy in heaven. If we are doing the kingdom right, like Charles Mooley, then it will feel right. So trust your gut. God made your gut after all. And if something makes you deeply happy, if something satisfies you above all else, if you just feel right when you're doing it, then keep doing it. Now, I'm not talking about sin, obviously. Now, that's a whole different subject. We never sin because it feels right. And ultimately, sin doesn't feel right. But do you know how to figure out if you're in the right church or not? Of course, you want to go to a church that teaches the truth about Jesus and the gospel, first and foremost. And I've been to many churches in my lifetime, and most of them taught the truth. But in some of them, something was wrong. While in others, something was just right. For example, when I attend my parents' church, I feel great. And it's not because of some sugary message. Even when the message is tough, I still feel... I still leave feeling encouraged and empowered. But for much of my life, I went to churches that left me feeling worse coming out than I did going in. They just expected too much. They were so hard on people. It was all about performance. Everyone was expected to conform to a standard that didn't have much to do with being like Jesus. But that's not what the church was meant to be. Unfortunately, church has been done that way for so long that folks don't know any different. They think that they're supposed to get yelled at and then leave church feeling like failures. Oh, that was a good service. That's just wrong-headed thinking. There was no humble person who ever walked away from Jesus feeling discouraged. Even when he pointed out their sin, it still felt good because they knew that he loved them and he just wondered what was best for them. So why are people walking away from church today feeling all beat up? I mean, isn't Jesus supposed to be there? Last time I checked. And it feels good to be in the presence of Jesus. And it feels right to do the things that he did. Folks, there's nothing wrong with that deep desire in your heart to be happy. And so don't deny it. I'm not talking about sin. Don't do sin. I'm saying there's nothing in wrong with that deep desire, deeper than sin, there's nothing wrong with that desire to be happy. Because if a grin is on your face, then you're in the right, pra in the right place. So embrace it. But people must have thought that Charles Mooley was out of his mind. People may have recognized the goodness in what he was doing, but surely they had thought he had, he had gone out of his mind. Yet, I mean, he had to sell all of it? Couldn't keep a little? 
but no one is crazy who does what makes them the happiest and most fulfilled, right? Maybe the ones who are crazy are the ones who are hoarding everything. So we need to figure out, we need to just forget about the world's economy and completely buy into the kingdom's economy. And that's our application from today's passage. It's in your bulletin. The application is get pedestrian beliefs out of your mind until pedestrians believe you're out of your mind. Get these pedestrian, these ordinary earthly beliefs out of your mind until pedestrians, until bystanders believe you're out of your mind. After all, you'd be in good company because passerbys thought Paul was out of his mind. Look when he was under trial in Acts 26. It says, as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. But Paul was okay with that. Look what he said in 2 Corinthians. For if we have lost our minds, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of God controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. You know, at one time, Jesus' own family thought he had lost it. Look at Mark 31. They went out to seize Jesus, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Talking about this kingdom where you give stuff away and you feel more alive. In reality, we look at J. Paul Getty. He lived according to the principles of this world's economy. And no one thought he was crazy for making as much money as he could. But in reality, it turned him into the world's biggest sourpuss. J. Paul Getty was the one who was out of his mind, doing the thing that made him miserable and keep doing it. But Charles Mooley lived according to the principles of the kingdom's economy. I mean, forget about the money, okay? It's not about money necessarily. But he lived according to the kingdom's principles to give himself away. And it made him the world's happiest and most fulfilled person. And even when he suffered a little bit of discomfort due to his generosity, which he sure did, he was still happy. Honestly, whose life would you rather live? So it's time to discharge all these notions of happiness and fulfillment. Maybe we've learned from our parents and our parents' parents and our parents' parents' parents. It's all wrong. All the conventional wisdom of our world is wrong. Think about it. Does this world seem like a happy place to you? God has made our hearts to respond in joy when we are living according to his principles. And if you can honestly say that being selfish with your time or your love or with your money or whatever is making you happy, then by all means, be selfish and greedy. But if you ever felt that real joy that wells up inside when you love those who don't deserve it, if you've ever felt that deep satisfaction in walking among the lowliest in our society, if you've ever felt the ultimate happiness that comes from living these crazy kingdom principles, then do more of what's making you happy because that's where the kingdom is. So just be comfortable being out of your mind because Jesus was considered out of his mind by the respectable people of this world too. Touch the lepers Bypass the rich to love the poor. Give more than you receive. Love those who hate you. Pray for those who hurt you. Find more joy in the presence of a child or a poor person than you do in the powerful and influential. These things won't get you rich in the world's economy, but you will be wealthy in God's economy. I suppose that our business model as a church makes no sense whatsoever. We have two major areas of outreach, uh, and we target clients who can't pay us back. We target the children in this neighborhood to love them and to share the gospel with them. And we target recovering drug addicts and alcoholics. And neither has any money. So how can a business who targets poor people survive financially? 
well, it's a good thing that God's economy isn't based on money, isn't it? We don't need more money. We need more of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is wherever real happiness is found. And so if there's a grin on your face, then you're in the right place. You're doing it right. So keep doing whatever brings joy to your heart, even if everyone else thinks you're out of your mind for doing it. And you'll be in good company. But no kingdom has ever survived without fighting a war from time to time, right? How else can the citizens of the country be protected? How else indeed? So I'm going to encourage you this week to read John 18, 33 through 38. And you bring a friend next Sunday as we ask a question about God's kingdom, war. What is it good for? We're going to talk about that next week. So read John 18, 33 through 30. You bring a friend, and you're going to be encouraged, I think, next week, just as you hopefully were encouraged today. Let's pray. God, I am so thankful that money doesn't mean anything in your kingdom, and you've got all the money in the world, and you don't need more of it. Lord, I, I know that we have been bogged down and for, for many years uh, as a church in America and other places where we think that miserable is somehow a badge of honor. You've never called us to misery. You've called us to joy. You haven't called us to an easy life, but you've called us to a joyful one. I pray we'd start taking that seriously as Christians in America. And Lord, as we exude your joy, that people will want to join. They'll want to come along. They'll find it. I pray that we would not be afraid to live out of our minds, just giving ourselves away to people, neighbors, friends, strangers, poor people, whoever. Pray we would give until we're out of our mind. And Lord, I pray that that joy that wells up inside would be undeniable. I pray that this would be the happiest place in this church on the south side of Des Moines because of the love that is being exuded to the community through this place. Thank you, God, that we don't need to be enslaved by the way the world does things that just brings more misery but we can be set free we thank you for these things we prayed in jesus name amen